All right, good morning, everyone. This is Mai Zhang, and it is about nine o'clock. And so my name is Mai Zhang. I'm the chair of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion uh, Advisory Council. I'd like to welcome the council members, guests, and community members joining by YouTube to this meeting of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. So before we start, I'd like to make a roll call. As I read your name, please say present. Uh, Robin Davis. Present. Kevin Carr. Reverend Dr. Monica Cummings. Good morning and present. Good morning. Adeshika Kidd. Vanessa McDowell. Aiden Paula. Marie Summers. Present. Good morning. Karen Timberlake. Present. Good morning. Don Krim. Present. Dr. LaVar Charleston. Present. Thank you. Emily Edmondson. Present. Victor Barnett. Jessica Bowling. Present. Good morning. Percy Brown, Jr. Q. L. Amin. Present. Good morning. And then Ruben Hopkins. And then Amy Pachesek. Marcasa Tucker. And Beth. Wabrowski, then Secretary Mary Kolar. We have Jessica Cavazzo, Nisreen Atada. Present. Good morning. And then Reverend Dr. Alex Gee. Tammy Rivera, Shondell Spivy, Greg Steinberg. Present. Good morning. Dr. Adawa White, and then Mai J. Lowley. Present. Good morning. Hi, Mai. This is um, Secretary Carr. I am present. Good morning, Secretary. Thank you for joining us. All right, well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements here. Please mute your mic or phone if you are not speaking. If you have a question, uh, please use the raised hand feature to be acknowledged. And you can find that at the bottom of your screen with the reaction. If you'd like to share, um, I'd also like to share that on Friday, October 21st, uh, the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council is invited to join the State Council on Affirmative Action for the Annual Diversity Awards. The Diversity Award recognizes the state agencies, Wisconsin's technical colleges, and UW campuses for their strong commitment to promote to the promotion of diversity workforce, of a diverse workforce, as measured by the creation of programs, initiatives, and practices. So uh, teams, please look for the invitations in your email that should be coming out. And then we also want to acknowledge uh, in advance that in September, from September 15th through the Oct October 15th is National Hispanic Heritage Month. And the theme this year uh, is Esperanza. And so 
moving on, last month, some announcement. Um, within the past, the pandemic, we haven't had the Hmong International Festival that has been celebrated last month. The 40th an anniversary of the Hmong International Freedom Festival was celebrated on July 2nd and 3rd. So there was a pause for three months and they, a three for the last couple of years, and they just finally had an, a successful event. Also on September 16th, uh, September 16th is the Trail of Tears Commemoration Day. And so the Trail of Tears was a series of forced uh, relocation of Native Americans. We are going, celebrating that. Um, the, and then in addition, congratulations to, next slide, yeah. So congratulations to the Wisconsin Latino Chamber of Commerce on its grant to further support Latino entrepreneurs across the state. Jessica Cavazzo and her team has done a wonderful job. So we're really excited to see the upcoming um, work that her team is going to be doing. And then next slide. From September 14th through 16th, the Hmong, uh, please join the Hmong American Leadership in Economic Development at the first annual um, HAIR conference. So HAIR stands for Hmong Economic Advancement, Research and Equity. This conference is geared towards Hmong entrepreneurs throughout the United States. Everyone is welcome of all um, background and that will be held in Eau Claire. Next slide. So this year, the Juneteenth flag flew above the Capitol in, in Madison. So we want to highlight, oh, my apologies. We want to highlight the, the flag that we were able to put up this year. So thank you so much for that. Um, we celebrate Juneteenth. And then if we could go back to the last slide, congratulations. We want to do a congratulations to Shandell Spivy for his inform informative and engaging article that he wrote uh, called Remaining, Reimagining Equity Work. That has been attached. Um, please take a look at that and take a moment to congratulate him. And lastly, for the announcement, we want to congratulate um, LaVar and Sherry on their presentation on the podcast of council member, Dr. Alex Gee. All right, uh, given that everyone should have gotten um, the meeting, the last meeting minutes and agenda. So today you, we will follow the Roberts rule. So action items listed on the agendas that everyone has gotten must be voted on. There will be a little, um, stamp on there, knowing those are the raised motion. So to make a motion, please raise your hand, state your name before you speak, and Louise will help us track the motions. And review the agenda and meeting materials, um, and then members should have four documents for this meeting. You should have your agenda, the PowerPoint, the large group discussion guidelines, and the May 2022 meeting minutes. So for, we will be taking actions. Uh, I will be ex now accepting a motion to approve today's agenda. So moved by Secretary Kevin Carr. Thank Second. you, Secretary. Second, LeVar Charleston. Thank you, LeVar. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. And then you all did also receive the draft of the May 13th meeting minutes. Um, I will now also accept a motion to approve the May minutes. So I move, Summers. I move approval. Thank you. Is this uh, Ms. Summers? Don. Yes. I move approval. Okay, Don, thank you. Thank you so much. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you so much. Now we will move um, to the next. And so today for this meeting, we want to welcome Governor Evers. Um, the governor has a few remarks from us. Governor Evers, if you are with us, we welcome you. Thanks so much, my zone. And uh, first of all, congratulate 
you on your first meeting presiding as chair of the council. Amaya has uh, been doing great work for our communities and our state from bridging communities at WIDA, advocating for the Hmong community and serving on the Eau Claire City Council to now in this new role. So it's my pleasure to appoint Mai as chair and uh, uh, I know she'll serve and lead this council well and I'm excited to see where she takes this work. Uh, we continue, a few updates uh, for members. We continue to plug away at getting our uh, ARPA dollars, the federal dollars out the door to support strong, equitable recovery across our state. From our $82 million equitable recovery grants would support health and early childhood and education, housing, environmental justice issues across our state, to our diverse business assistance grant programs that went to uh, CDFIs and, and diverse chambers of commerce, to our neighborhood investment fund and healthcare infrastructure fund that are building transformational facilities and services in communities across our state. So I'm excited to say those funds are getting out the door and into folks' hands and great organizations all across our state that started breaking ground on these projects and providing services to their uh, communities. Over the last couple of weeks, I've also been glad to announce um, more great grant programs that address health and wellness in our state, including more than $14 million for mental health services and expanding our behavioral uh, workforce, uh, especially for our kids and especially for children's Wisconsin, Children in Wisconsin Hospital new, and their new mental health walk-in clinic, one of the first in the nation. I also announced $10 million for a new well compensation grant program that will help families clean up their contaminated wells, ensuring everyone has access to clean drink, drinking water, which is a basic human right. Um, uh, FYI, in Wisconsin, there are uh, uh, over 800,000 uh, private wells, and many of them in our rural, rural communities. And it's not just homes either. You'll see child care uh, facilities and, and that have private wells, uh, bars and restaurants and, and other commercial places. And so we, uh, we, we feel it's important that all people have uh, clean drinking water and uh, uh, this, this new program will help that. And you'll hear from our new executive director and CEO of WIDA, Elmer, Elmer Moore Jr. in just a minute, but I was also glad to join WIDA in announcing a $32.4 million grant towards to fill a gap created by rising construction costs and supply chain delays for multi-housing, excuse me, multi-family housing projects as we continue to work and expand affordable housing in our state. So great work uh, is happening and transforming communities and businesses all across the state as these dollars go out the door. Um, so um, I just want to share something that Larice uh, shared with our, my office. Uh, it's a quote from the, uh, the movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Uh, and and uh, the quote around that is, anything mentionable is manageable. This quote describes the correlation between conversations about change and strategic planning to implement that change. So the conversations you all have been having make us ready for that change. And I look forward to working with all of you on these solutions. What has started with the council, the commitment, the conversations, the planning has made them mentionable, seem manageable. As I tra travel across the state, I see the people of Wisconsin are hopeful. We're moving forward, taking on new challenges, solving lingering problems. And I can't thank you enough for the role you have played in creating that hope and finding bold solutions. So my office will be reaching out to speak with you all about your interest in continuing to serve on this council and the ideas you have for the council as we go forward into a new year. You all have done great work and have the conversations around what change can look like. And we now get to moving into planning and implementation. So contact Kara if you have any questions about that, but she'll be reaching out to you for sure. As always, thank you for your continued work on the council and in your communities. Wisconsin's a better place to live, learn and work. 
due to your good work. I look forward to continuing that work with this council to build a Wisconsin that works for everyone. Now, I am excited uh, to introduce somebody new to the council. We've already previewed our next guest, but I'm happy to introduce the new executive director and CEO of Lita, Elmer Moore Jr. Elmer, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Governor, uh, for the introduction, and thank you so much for this opportunity. So I'm, I'm going to be very brief in my remarks. I want to introduce myself. My name is Elmer Moore, as you've already heard, uh, and I'm just elated to get to be the CEO and Executive Director of WIDA. If you would allow me to give you potentially a reintroduction to what WIDA is and what WIDA is working on. At our core, we are the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. And I want you all to understand that we recognize that equity has to be absolutely central in our work. We understand and appreciate the fact that people of color, people of different abilities, and people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community have been historically, systematically, and systemically disenfranchised and unable to access fair and affordable housing. And so our work is not just housing an end unto itself. We understand that affordable housing impacts so many other parts of the person and other parts of our state. We understand that housing is a health issue and a mental health issue. We also understand it's an economic prosperity concern. So just imagine that there's folks who are overpaying their rent or they are rent burdened or they are unable to access generational wealth creation because they can't buy a house. They can't access a fair, uh, affordable mortgage. All of those issues create economic drag that in fact limits all of our abilities to succeed. And so at WIDA, what we are doing is uh, happily interacting and partnering with our uh, sibling agencies, as well as happily receiving the support of Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes, as we do the work to create access to safe, stable, and most importantly, affordable housing. I'm really excited to partner with the council. I'm really excited to hear from many of the council members, as I have already, to determine ways that we can better create opportunities to access affordable housing for all, for all the folks throughout the state. Um, my door is open, my proverbial door is open, my lines are open. Please do reach out to me and or anyone from the, the WIDA staff and the WIDA family. My is an excellent representative of the kind of engagement we wanna have with our community, as well as important and necessary conversations around promoting equity and assuring that everyone has fair access to the things that they need to prosper. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to introduce a little bit about WIDA. Uh, and I look forward to future conversations. Thank you, and Governor. Back to you, Governor. Or thank you, Governor Evers and Elmer. Uh, I am honored to please now welcome the Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes to join us for a few remarks. My, so it, it appears. Oh, it appears Lieutenant Governor hasn't joined us yet. But if he's able to come in, we will move him on the agenda. Um, he should be um, available at 930. So we will adjust. OK? OK, that, that um, works. My, did you want me to speak for 12 more minutes? I, I'd happily do that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Thank you. <laughs> um, Laurie, I, th I think that works. So we can move on to the, and then with Lieutenant Governor Barnes not being able to join us till 930, you know, um, Governor Evers and Elmer, you are more than welcome to please hang in with us as we report out some of the activities from our committees or subcommittees. Um, all right, so we will move on to the subcommittee reports while we wait for Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. And so we could start with my Joe, the uh, Community Engagement Committee, subcommittee. 
Thank you, Mai. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, our subcommittee, the community engagement has been or has created an opportunity to work with the Department of Tourism um, to learn about its services and the opportunities for our local community that is doing related work to diversity and inclusion. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to learn about how to do potential webinar series or event development series with the Department of Tourism and also how to expand their um, staff and board um, to have a more inclusive representation. Um, and also we will be formally assessing our official meeting um, dates and times because it's been almost two years now and we're going to be looking to see what works best for everybody's busy schedules and so we will be reporting that out my at that time. Thank you so much, my Joe. Okay. Now we'll pass it on to data. Uh, Robin Davis. Yes, good morning, mine. Thank you. Um, good morning to my fellow council members and members of the public. Um, I am um, honored to report on behalf of the data and policy subcommittee and want to thank them for um, their continued uh, regular engagement, which allows us uh, to hear from state agencies, the public, and then also engage in some very robust discussion as we continue to move forward in our work plan. By way of review, the charge of our subcommittee is to review data policy statutes and regulations to eliminate barriers and gaps and inequities in home ownership, business development, and employment. Our guiding statement for this work is to co-create recommendations with our fellow council members for Wisconsin public, including state agencies and private sector policies that will inform the changes that are needed to move Wisconsin uh, towards building um, organizational cultures that will embed um, equity and inclusion in recruitment, hiring, onboarding, and promotion. And towards that end, we developed um, a number of strategies to help us move the work forward and decided to start with recruitment um, as our first, first focus. And in terms of recruitment, we are looking at um, what are the ways to expand advertising and outreach efforts to attract a more diverse pool of applicants um, for state government employment opportunities? And then how do we expand pipelines of diverse applicants with the necessary skills and experience for high priority um, government positions? And because of uh, the engagement of our subcommittee and their many connections within the community and experience, we've been able to invite presenters to share with us um, their lesson learn lessons learned and their um, successes. So at our June 16th meeting, we had a presentation by the city of Racine. Uh, Vicki Selko, who is the manager of strategic initiatives and community partnerships, for uh, working with Mayor Corey Mason, as well as Damian Evans, who is the equity officer for the city of Racine. And so they both talked about the city's equity workforce plan, how they are connecting with city department leaders with the support of the Racine Common Council, as well as their strategies to work collaborative, collaboratively with public and private sector organizations. Um, so it was a great, in-depth presentation. There were lots of questions from our subcommittee um, in terms of how are they going to be measuring uh, goals, outcomes. Um, and once again, as I mentioned earlier, what are the, um, the successes and the lessons learned and how can we take that information and share that out, um, not just with this council, but beyond. Um, and because they are early in the work, we invited our, those presenters to return to the committee in a year so that we could hear the updates and hear about the progress that they are making. Um, and then on our July 21st meeting, uh, we invited Tanya Evans, who is the director of the Bureau of Milwaukee Enrollment Services, and Shannon Kavorik, who is an HR generalist and uh, with the Bureau of Human Services, to share with us how they um, went about their recruitment strategy for the director of the newly created department, Office of Health Equity, which is focused on health equity. And so it was once again, a great uh, presentation where they talked about how they use 
um, the standard state recruiting channels, but then also how they uh, innovated uh, in other ways, using connections with HC, HBCUs and others, LinkedIn and other strategies. So once again, um, great presentations, uh, a lot of great information that we're going to incorporate as we move forward. Next on our agenda for September will be a presentation from Jobs Work Milwaukee, which looks at um, creating, overcoming barriers to long-term employment and um, helping to motivate the, the folks that they work with in, in terms of their employment journey. Um, and then we are also gonna be developing a survey to go out to this council to um, solicit your ideas, your information, your connections on other um, innovative employment practices that will help, help us move the work forward. So that is our report. Um, I will open it up if there are any subcommittee members who want to briefly um, add to uh, the overall subcommittee report. All right, hearing none, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mai. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, and we will hand that over to Dr. LaVar. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mai. Uh, thank you, uh, committee members. Uh, and, and thanks to the work and diligence of the Economic and Business Development uh, Subcommittee. Um, as we have been going about our work, uh, we have been really digging into uh, the equity work plan that we've crafted. Um, particularly in regard to uh, current or potential programs and initiatives. Uh, one of the challenges of our work has been to understand everything that is going on <laughs> in our area, in this area, in an effort to sort of not reinvent the wheel and to better illuminate uh, these opportunities and perhaps encourage more uh, repositories for resources or, or connections to easy accessibility to resources uh, for business owners or future business owners. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot to learn uh, from statewide uh, available data and our, our subcommittee continues to identify uh, reports, documentation, individuals and entities throughout the state that will help us gain a better understanding of the full landscape of efforts that are occurring across the state. Uh, we're asking we're asking the question, uh, what else do we need to know that we don't know, um, really in an effort to embody some data informed decision making to ensure our efforts are truly effective and not um, ineffective or redundant. Right. Uh, to that end. Uh, we are we are continuing to have substantive conversations with folks who have been hard at work in terms of enhancing opportunities for uh, individuals who have been historically marginalized in terms of the business entrepreneurial or procurement enterprises. Uh, in June, at our June meeting, we welcomed Director of the Wisconsin Supplier Diversity Program, Tondra Davis, uh, to our subcommittee. Uh, we had a very productive and constructive conversation um, as a part of our efforts to both inventory and capitalize on our state's uh, existing strengths. Uh, we were apprised of the many efforts and successes her, her office has uh, been undergoing and through that interaction engagement, really probed us to brain wrestle on how we might add value to these efforts, as well as assess potential areas of opportunity across business enterprises. And so uh, meeting with Mrs. Davis uh, really helped us to crystallize our thinking in many ways, but in, in two ways specifically. Um, one, what else, uh, what what's out there or needs to be out there for businesses? And two, what are the best or emergent practices that promote collaboration, professional development, access, and success uh, for businesses? Um, and because we have the pleasure of having the secretary of the DOA on our committee, we realized that the DOA is a natural convener across state agencies. And so we continue to brain wrestle around how the DOA could enhance uh, our efforts working across and collaborating with other state agencies and how our subcommittees uh, efforts might encourage more connectedness and more collaborative effort for the ultimate goal of identifying and implementing uh, systemic strategies that will increase the utilization of marginalized groups and women-owned businesses uh, through state contracting and other support mechanisms. Uh, we have a new uh, director, Wida. We, we may uh, tap uh, him as well. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, Director Moore, um, and we have some other folks on the docket that we are looking to uh, to, to gain some more information that would inform uh, our decision making and, and and our equity work plan. And so uh, I'll do the same uh, thing as as Robin and say if if there's any members of our group who would like to add to this, 
Um, and if not, that will conclude our um, committee report for this, our subcommittee report on, on today. All right, thank you all. Uh, Mai? Thank you so much, Dr. LeVar. Charleston, it's been a pleasure. It's been a heck of a year that our committee, subcommittees has been working really, really hard at their plans and their work plans. I'm really excited um, for the next few uh, sessions here that we're gonna be the next meeting that we're gonna hear reports from you. And now we wanna take a moment to welcome Lieutenant Governor Barnes for joining us today for some remarks. Hey, thank you so much. Sorry for being a, a little bit late here. Just want to pop in and say thank you all so much for your work. Want to thank you for the introduction. I'm Mandela Barnes, and got to give you a uh, huge congratulations, my, on becoming the uh, new chair of the council. Uh, you are. I can't think of a more deserving person in this role, and I'm absolutely looking forward to continue to work with you moving forward. And I know that taking this on is voluntary, but it's so, so very necessary. And I am deeply appreciative of your personal commitment to advancing <clears throat> all the work that we do, as well as your commitment to the council. Uh, you are here for a reason. Now, throughout my entire tenure as Lieutenant Governor of the state, I've been able to travel to all 72 counties to meet with people from different communities who are making change. And the people that I've met with range from state employees to farmers to CEOs, fast food workers, everybody in between. And all these individuals come from different backgrounds. They work at different places and they all have different struggles. But they all have at least two things in common. One, they're all Wisconsinites. And two, they all want to be a part of the solution to solving the problems that we face as a state. Now, these are people who are making change on large and small scales just like we are, and we can't discount those folks. And that's why it's essential to recognize the efforts of individuals as they navigate complex systems within their various communities. And now the work of this council is important, not only because we have the collective expertise and the vision to create a better tomorrow, but we can also advise the individuals who are striving every day to make change even on smaller scales. So through our work here on the Governor's Equity Inclusion Advisory Council, we do have the support of leaders at the highest levels, and we also have a real opportunity to see last and change. And that's why I'm so grateful to every single member of this council. I want to thank you all for your hard work and your dedication. I want to just say again how proud of the work that I am that we are all putting in together. I, just like you, am so, or just like I hope you are, I'm very excited to continue working towards making the state of Wisconsin a more equitable place for every single person who lives here. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. And so I, we're really excited to, we are excited to have you. And we also wanna take a moment to thank uh, Governor Evers, uh, the Lieutenant and Elmer for joining us today. It has been a pleasure to hear updates and the success that Wisconsin is moving towards equity. Uh, given that we are a little early, Larisha, we... We are a little early. There are no more yep. questions. We'll go ahead and take a break a little bit early. There's a 15 minute break. Please um, return in 15 minutes. All right, thank you so much.
All right, it is now 948. <laughs> and I want to welcome the council back from break. I hope you all had uh, grabbed your coffee, refreshed a little bit um, with energy. Um, this afternoon, we will be going to a presentation in large group discussions. But before that, I would like to have Larice Lincoln, um, our director of the Bureau of Equity and Inclusion, provide us with some important updates. Morning, everybody. I hope that, um, like my, you had a chance to walk away from your computer for a moment and check up, check on some. Um, take care of yourselves and grab your coffee and come back for a second half of what we hope will be um, informational information for you to use as we move forward. Um, I don't know if many of you remember, but um, when one of our first council meetings, we provided you with a live training from one of our DOA attorneys on the Wisconsin Public Records Law. And that training was wonderful and dynamic, and we appreciate so much that she was able to do that. Um, for you um, during one of our council meetings. However, since that time, we, we have done is made this meeting um, something that you can access. And it's an interactive meeting that you can do on your own. And all um, council appointees are required to complete this training, which is why we did it um, that day and we need you to do it again this year. Um, you should have received an email from me and you will receive a follow-up email from me with the same information to remind you that you will need to access our Cornerstone training um, program and complete the Wisconsin Public Law training. This training must be completed by you by November 30th. Um, and the instructions were included in the email. Um, once you access that um, website, you would enter the initial password that was provided for you and then enter your own subsequent private password for you to be able to access this on a regular basis. Um, your name was added to the list, so you would not be able to access this without having permission. So no one else can share this or enter this um, platform and do this training except for you. If you have any questions or if you have any concerns with accessing the platform, please contact me directly and we will work that out for you or you can contact our training department, um, or I can contact them for you. But we really need to make sure that everyone on the council has completed the training by November 30th. It probably takes about 15 minutes at the most. Um, and um, it's very entertaining, very interactive, and very informative. So we look forward to having you complete that, um, printing out your certificate or, you know, downloading your certificate and forwarding a copy of that for me so that I can put it in the council official records. All right, thank you so much for that. I also you. wanted to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Louise. Was there any questions about that from anybody? Okay. I also wanted to take a moment to share with you some of the ups, up, uh, updates that have been made to the council's website. So if we could put that up, that would be great. Are you seeing it? No, we're not seeing that. It's okay. There it is. All right. So um, the the governor's council has its own web page on the DOA site, and um, you can access this through the link that's usually in the on on your agenda, or you can access this by typing Governor's Equity and Inclusion Council into the um, into the search bar, and it should come up. What we did was change the ribbon. We added. Um, in the about GEIAC drop down areas that um, explain different aspects of the council, including information about the executive order um, that brought the council into being, as well as um, put in the council leadership and currently our chair, 
my is listed as well as our subcommittee chairs on that page. We also included um, a page of all of the members. So all the members of the council are listed um, with the photos that were provided by you. Um, the next thing we added to the ribbon was the committees. Um, each of the committees would be the Community and Engagement Committee first. And if you look, it has the charge of that committee, the members of that committee, as well as um, the, the strategic plan of that committee, including their guiding statement, their goals and strategies. And we've done that for each group, data and policy. with their strategies and um, guiding statement, and also economic and business development. And we will continue to expand each of these committee pages as work and information is provided. There's also um, the public forum area where we document all of the meetings. Um, the live stream link is there for people who are watching the meeting today as well as um, upcoming meetings for our committees and um, public notice agenda and meeting minutes from all of the meetings that we have had in the past. There is a record there. So we're very excited about this opportunity to um, make this web page available publicly so that people can see the great work that's being done by the council. So, Thank you very much. I hope that you have a chance to visit the page. Um, please provide any feedback or um, updates or ideas that you might have about how this page can grow and expand. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larise. Um, the website looks beautiful. Larise and her team did a wonderful job. If you haven't taken a look at that, please go do. There's lots of information and updates to the site. So Larise, thank you for your, uh, you and your team's hard work. And so we'll, next we'll be moving on to um, a presentation on mapping. And so we thought it'd be beneficial for the council to go through a map mapping session to move us towards action for each of our subcommittees. After the presentation, we will go into a large group discussion. All members, um, you all should have received the large group discussion guideline that also includes two, the two questions that the group will discuss after the presentation. And so we are, as we're looking at moving towards action, oh, Luis, if I could have you move to the next slide. Uh, we'll want to, since the start of this council, uh, we have done a fair amount of planning with Larissa's, uh, her department's help as, as subcommittees on your own. You've done uh, a number of planning sessions, met with a number of folks and did your research. So to ensure the successful ex execution of our charges for each of our committee and the whole council, the council as a whole, Again, each of your committees has gone through some part of a strategic planning process. And so with that, we just want to quickly review the strategic planning process of where we have been. And so part of the strategic process, planning process is doing the discovery piece. The discovery task that each of your team have been doing is uh, gathering information, uh, doing surveys and questionnaires for each uh, different committees or or industry that you have been, you're targeting, and then reviewing of documentations, policies, and procedures. Again, those currently existing strategic plans that departments have or that's existing, and other background materials. So that's part of the discovery, and as we. This last few months, we have been doing the analyze, analysis of those as you come through with your goals is reviewing the information gathered during the discovery, um, identifying strengths and weaknesses in the current environment, if you have not, most of you have, and then evaluating the gaps between the current environment and the desired state. 
I would say which many of you have done most of these, but most committees are probably in the process of evaluating the gaps right now. Um, and we do wanna to move towards the findings and the recommendations with your goals. And so with uh, findings and recommendations, the next step is that gap analysis and report card that you'll wanna produce, um, the recommendations that will come out of that, the action plans to the goals um, that could be executed and the roadmaps for migrating to the desired future state that we wanna take um, for our, our goals that we've picked, we've chosen. So next slide, please. And so our goal is to identify barriers to each of the goals that has been identified and set forth by each of our subcommittees. So in order for us to identify the barriers, we'll wanna look at these different steps um, of identifying barriers to goals. And these are just some examples that we put on here as far as an, you know, uh, a model for us to use or consider as we're going through and identifying those barriers is as you identify uh, your goal, an example uh, for identifying a goal is making our community farming a farm program multi-generational by allowing parents and children to plant vegetables together. So that was in this example, the goal. And so how do we identify the barriers? You'll wanna look at what is it? What is the barrier, right? An example of the barrier is progress, the program staff is used to the current program and does only outreach to older farmers. So as we're talking about multi-generational, that could be a barrier that we're picking. Um, and the next barrier that you wanna take a look at to kind of dive, Breaking that down is now, if that is a barrier, is that a barrier internal or external? And so because it's staffing and this is internal evaluation, we know that you know now that's an internal. And you'll wanna look at the barrier again some more is who holds the power to that, uh, that to changing that barrier, right? So the, power holder, the person who has power in this case would be the program manager or supervisor that we would wanna connect to about that particular barrier that is preventing us from moving the program to multi-generational. And so then the last question is now that we've identified the three pieces to the barrier of what is it? Is the barrier internal or external? And then who holds that power to making those changes? And then what action can be done to, uh, or taken to remove this barrier? And that's by having, and the only way we're gonna have no is when we have spoken to all the folks who have the power or identified that to know what steps has been taken already. So next slide, please. Um, so in order for us to help us identify who holds the power and what actions can be taken to remove this barrier, will want to power map our audience. So know who our audience is, right? Uh, a couple of questions for your subcommittees to look at if you haven't already is who are the people that should be, we should be talking to? Are you talking to enough people and the right people? So identifying the people uh, you need to include and the power that they hold uh, to make a decision. And so when we do do um, activities like this or have a new um, program or project that we're doing, we always do, um, If I always use the power mapping tool to really help um, us identify as part of this strategic plan is what existing programs are currently in place and who is managing them. So if you look at this um, chart here, is utilizing this, uh, this cross, this section, if in this section, um, in the most influent, the upper section, you would want in this upper right corner here, is going to be those that are most influenced and powerful. You'll wanna list them as far as those that have, um, there are most influenced, and powerful and to the right here, they are also strongly supportive of your goals. So you'll wanna find those folks and put them, list them on here to identify, okay, who is on your team? 
who is influential and are able to, and, and currently is supportive. You also want to identify who's also influential, but may strongly oppose um, that particular, the goal that you're trying to work with. Um, and, and then the lower part here and the lower left corner here is those that are uh, soup are strongly opposing, but they are also uh, less, least influential. Um, those are the folks that you know they're opposing. They're not very influential in that, but they could also create some sort of ripple impact. Um, and then you do also have your constituents or those that are uh, strongly supportive, but may not have the most um, influence in that. And this is these are the, the folks that you'll want to connect with as far as, okay, they may not have uh, influence, but they're supportive. Where can we fit them? Um, and that could be, let's say, the staff, some of the staff. Up here could be the director or of the department or the CEO or the board. Um, over here could also be, let's say, the direct manager, right? Um, of the program, it could be either or. And so you want to be able to identify that um, to, to be able to connect with them. An example is a while ago, we were trying to pass a policy. And in order for us to do that, uh, we needed to know who was all the game players in there and who had control or who's already working on what. And while they are not um, strong, they strongly oppose, this allowed us to build some momentum around how we could really connect and create some common grounds to move the project towards a better good of all. And so the power mapping does at least give you a visual look of who you need to connect with and help you brainstorm with that. Next um, slide, please. And so continuing with the power mapping, you'll wanna take one goal at a time and review each associated strategy, identify all the players who is, and answering those questions, right? Who is the person who can make the decision to act? Uh, what are they already doing, right? And why are they opposing? And, and that's exactly what happened with our policy is the person who is strongly opposing, they had their own policy they were trying to, to work with. And so we have to understand what that was and what they were already doing and how can we complement each other to really be on the same page. So what are they already doing? Be specific, right? When you identify that, be specific, name that person, and role and be inclusive and in inviting them to the table um, of trying to understand and brainstorm what they're doing uh, and how you all could work together. And so brainstorm the names of organized stakeholders and influencers, um, who are the people directly affected who may not necessarily be involved. And these are the people that are the least influential, but could be um, opposing or being strongly uh, supportive, right? And those are the folks that will also be the support group for your team. While they may not be making the decision, they could also be helping you with garnering support. Um, and then, it also helps too, because I think in the, the policy realm, knowing who are the folks that are gonna come and protest against what you are doing, those are the people that you would wanna be able to hedge around them. That's why the power mapping, those people are crucial because they also then create that ripple effect. And so mapping the players, where does the player sit in terms of influence over the decision? Again, going to the map, um, and then supporting your goal or recommendation, right? And so when you're dealing with policies, dealing with changes, there are always going to be folks that will come to the table um, in support or not support, and they can either have power or not have uh, the, the power to make um, changes. And so identifying those relationships too. So identify any known links between any of the players and draw the lines uh, between them to indicate connections. Um, this will help your team reach decision makers indirectly and to advise the influencer. So what you may see is that you may see a connection between those that are uh, opposing and they may have a connection. Um, you may have someone who is really supportive 
and has the power and influence in that section that is also connected to the person that has influence but it's unsupportive but you could and then leverage the, the relationship to kind of draw in that neutral conversation. So this is where um, knowing the re knowing where you're identifying those, re uh, those relationships is key, uh, that warm handoff and uh, the creating our support uh, helps. And then of course the research piece, right? Ensuring that these subcommittees is researching and understanding what current solutions are out there and find out what is working and what is not, right? Uh, you, the, the council has probably heard me talk about this on a numerous occasion about not working in silos. Oftentimes we are all trying to achieve for the same goal. It's just the different pathways that we're getting there. And so it's great to know, to find out what are we all trying to achieve together and what tactics has been, um, uh, tried already so that we are not working in silos and trying to dupl duplicate efforts and utilize resources. So this is also allowing your team, if you have not yet done this, is to encourage your team to conduct your SWOT analysis. So that's identifying the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats within your subcommittees of what you're trying to do. So for example, um, I'm going to, I will use economic development because that's my background. And I would say, hey, we're looking for contracts, right? What are the current strengths that our, um, if we're looking at the state level, what is our current strengths? What, what has been done and what is the weakness is that power, manpower, capital, resource, finance, you list all of that and the opportunities and threats. And, um, and so there's lots of resources on that for your team. Be happy to get somebody out if you guys to, to help your uh, respective committee if you want to do that and need some resources on how to do that. Um, but we encourage you to do a SWOT analysis. So next slide. And so, you know, how do we advance and complement the current uh, the work currently taking place, as I mentioned earlier, um, because there are a lot, the, the state of Wisconsin has so many different departments, so many different initiatives, it's ever changing, so many moving pieces. So we, as a, as a council, as an advisory council, we want to make sure that we could advance and complement the current work that's taking place to really then make the, make changes happen, right? And so how, couple things that um, your committee should be asking is how does the goals and strategies of the council align with the current landscape of work taking place, right? Of the current work that is embedded. Um, order, uh, our, um, the Order 59 did also have state agencies working on equity and inclusion. So the goal is to look at what is the current initiatives that has came out of that and how can our council help support some of these and, and improve, right? Or provide suggestions and support to, to ensuring that we're all leading towards the same um, place. And so who are the stakeholders do you wanna reach out to? So each department, not all departments may be working specifically on uh, equity and inclusion, but there are specific task force. So knowing who are the stakeholders, what is being done, are there specific subsets of the committee um, you also want to reach? So instead, maybe it could be women, men, elders, ch children, and their parents, working families. You'll want to know where these stakeholders are, who they are that you want to reach. Um, you also want to know, are there specific subsets of agencies you want to reach, right? So... And again, going back to economic development, we have three different agencies uh, or more that does economic development that works with businesses. And so knowing those departments, like the Department of Administrators and Directors, um, there's also other qualified government agencies that are working on um, economic development. So these are the agencies you want to work with of how do you how do you bridge these resources and these gaps and bridge these silos, right? As we, we are stronger when we could all communicate and speak the same language. Um, and again, that goes, do they engage with your committee, subcommittees, right? Um, 
But once you identify these, again, it comes back to the power mapping of who's all the, you know, the team players and the stakeholders and have you spoken to all of these guys is when um, you can ask, answer that question is, is do they engage with your subcommittee? If they haven't, then we wanna make sure that you are engaging with them to knowing what they're already doing and also identifying if, um, if they're on board with you, right? And how you guys could get garner that support from them. Next slide, please. And so mapping those assets, again, uh, it comes back to knowing your the landscape and engaging uh, community members in identifying communities. That's where you want to know who your target is. Um, so when you know what the, the your target is, you would want to engage those community members in identifying community assets and needs specific to the subcommittee goals. Um, We'll want to know if, have, for again, economic development, have you spoken to stakeholders or businesses to know exactly what are the challenges, right? Um, have you got the chance to do that? And then have you got the chance to speak with agencies who's working with these to understand what are the barriers that they're also seeing in connecting with these individuals? And then engaging agency stakeholders, again, that's what I, I just mentioned, in identifying current initiatives and projects specific to your subcommittee's goal. Uh, there is a difference between speculation and documentation. A lot of times um, we make the overall blanket statement that we think we know our community best, but there's also a different narrative around that. I like to say I do not speak on behalf of the entire Hmong community. Um, but as a Hmong person with the experience, I only know from what I've experienced. So it's also good to be able to be in connect with those that are in at the ground level facing those challenges. So there is a difference between that speculation and documentation. Um, again, I think there's a value of why we're collecting data is the anecdotal data varies also from the, the documented data. So we wanna make sure that um, we understand and draw a line between the speculation piece of just making blanket statement and also taking the initiative to really connect with folks and document the actions that you've done. Um, and the real value of our work comes from the positive impact and sustainability of the change uh, taking place. And so we realized um, it hailed uh, as we work through a equitable economic development strategies, we know that equity cannot come from a singular source. We need all players to be in this game in order for us to really achieve equity and close the gap because we have to look at it through a holistic lens of what are all the moving pieces that could contribute to the issue. Um, and how do we support each other so we're not working in silos and not missing out on those gaps. The next slide. And so that leads us to moving to action planning. I know you guys have been working on uh, collecting a lot of data, a lot of information, um, lots of conversation going on. Now it's time to really, as we're heading to our last meeting of the year um, that's coming up, is encouraging you all to look at the action planning piece of what are some of those things um, as you identify your goals, subcommittees, you've already currently identified your goals. Um, now looking at what are the barriers in place that could impact the subcommittee's goals, right? Um, example act is actions is not aligned in alignment with current initiatives, right? You'll wanna look at your goals after you do that in-depth analysis of is your goals also in alignment with what is currently happening at the state or are we duplicating um, and how can we bring, how could we refine that or come together to strengthen the, your current initiatives or the current initiatives that it's happening to? So identifying the barriers. So what barriers is in place that can impact your goals? What are the supports or resources in place that could address barriers to these subcommittee goals? Um, the person who has those answers are those, those that have power and have resources to make changes. So you want to really, again, engage, right? Are we engaged with the right people in the process? Are they giving us the right resources we need to ensure that this can move forward? Um, so that's finding, identifying your barrier, your goals, knowing your barriers, 
and then finding your support and or resources and then action steps, right? What actions will be best uh, support, right? Will, will best support collaborative effective changes as I talk about um, that singular source, right? It cannot make the change to equity. We need to bring all of those. So what best what, what are those supportive collaborative efforts that we could bring together? Are recommendations reasonable and feasible or is the first action in support of capacity building, right? So identifying where you are at is being realistic and holistic about our actions is, are we ready to actually make change or do we need some more capacity building? Um, so, and, and those are identifying your next action steps. So next slide, please. So given that as we walk through this uh, power mapping and this mapping presentation, I want to give an opportunity for our subcommittees to ask any questions around this process. Um, and where I'm hopeful that the presentation has uh, given you some takeaways to, to be able to move you towards action. So I'll open this up for questions. All right, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, drop it in the chat, raise your hand. If uh, no, I see no questions, we can move on to um, our discussion. So the goal for after this, uh, this presentation is to have a group discussion. Um, I think we are all feeling the pressure. We're also all have been very overwhelmed with collecting data and this is the time and chance for us all as group to come together collaboratively and have this conversation and answer these two crucial questions um, within our group is what recommendations and um, for this group discussion, I ask that you could raise your hand um, to chime in. Uh, I am really good at calling out names also with making sure that we're all engaging, but we do wanna make sure that we can have a robust conversation and have some great takeaways, learn from each of our committee's partners here. Um, and a lot of you guys are leaders in, in your field, you've been doing this, you know, you do, you live and breathe this. And so this is a, a great time for us to share those. Um, Larice, would you? Yes. So we, we're gonna go through, and Larice will also check the chats for us for questions for, and share that with us. Would yes, that be I will good? do that. Okay. <laughs> and so moving to the questions is what recommendations do you have um, to align, these are the two questions. What recommendations do you have to align the subcommittee work with activities already taking place within uh, communities? And then how can we use our voices to inform and support work already in process in state government? And so please refer to, again, the large group discussion. Um, Luis, may I pass that over to you to help us facilitate this session? Sure, I can, I can help with that. So if we wanted to start with the first question, um, what recommendations do you have to align the subcommittee work with activities already taking place within the communities? It would be very um, helpful if some of the members of each subcommittee could talk about or discuss their own ideas related to that, their work. Please identify yourself and your subcommittee and let us know what recommendations you have or what actions you may have already taken um, to align the subcommittee's work with, with your communities. And the communities can be your um, the, the public communities that you're working with or state groups that you are working with. I know that the business and economic group has always had the privilege of giving their report last. So why don't we start with someone from that group? Please feel free to open your mic and respond. <clears throat> so we're, we're so are we just answering these questions here, starting that conversation? Just yes. to clarify. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I think that uh, particularly as it relates to number one, like rec what recommendations do you have to align the subcommittee work with activities already taking place within communities? I think as I sort of given in our um, in our uh, report that, you know, prior to crafting our equity workforce plan, I, I'm not certain that we gathered all the information that we needed to be more informative. So we're kind of um, reflecting, moving forward, reflecting, going back and forth to see how our recommendations align with what's already happening. So it's, it's a, a little bit of a challenge to, add, to answer this question because we're still, I would, I would say, steeped in this, pro, in this process. There are certain entities that we haven't had the opportunity to talk to and engage with and, and, and we're you know, steadily coming up with more, uh, at least initiatives or um, entities that are supposedly doing economic, I'm not saying they're not, I'm, just, I'm not saying they're not, but there's a lot of uh, um, entities across the state that has economic development as one of their moniker or, or you know, part of their moniker. So um, the challenge is, is I think we would be hasty to provide recommendations right now while we're still sort of uncovering sort of new and innovative strategies or entities that are doing this work. So we're kind of not backtracking, but like pausing just a little bit to, to, to make sure that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's and again, trying to uncover where synergies align between uh, our, our uh, subcommittee and others. What we do know is kind of how I alluded to uh, before is that there are, um, there are some in, uh, important or um, relevant folks who are in our, are in our committee who have positions, uh, state positions or across the state or uh, that, that could add value to our work as well and can help build these bridges. Uh, in terms of communication or moving the agenda forward. We know even as it relates to state entities that uh, things like uh, there could be more communication and more collaboration between uh, entities like work uh, 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 marketplace and and some of our efforts and 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 you know we want to ensure that there's not uh, and we have this issue at the University of Wisconsin Madison as well, where you know there are folks who are doing things that are similar, and it's kind of um, uh, you know decentralized, and folks are kind of have their head down, going about their own business, and not taking advantage of the opportunity to collaborate because we have uh, similar uh, 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 goals, values, and things. I see Ruben unplugged here, so I'm, I'm thinking he wants to say something as well. Uh, Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my, yeah, my apologies for being late. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to listen a little longer because I just actually chimed in, so I don't want to. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you out. I thought you, uh, um, I thought you were here and unplugged because you want to respond here. So, um, but my, I'll stop there. I just, just or uh, uh, Larice, I'll stop oh. there just to sort of get us started. I think that you make some great points about. Um, it being a little bit early to make some of those recommendations as you are still learning uh, a lot about the landscape that is in front of you. I think that with thinking about that, um, would you be able to um, share or any of any of the subgroups be able to share what are some of the ways in which you are identifying those groups that you need to speak to? Um, um, em Secretary Emerson, you have your hand up. Would you respond to that? Thanks. Sure. Happy to. Um, and thanks, Dr. Charleston, for getting us started. Um, I think that was a really um, accurate summary of sort of, um, you know, it reminds me of, of kind of um, circling the issue. And I think where we started was with the lived experience of some of the members of our subgroup um, to say, this is what it looks like and feels like to us as members of um, communities impacted by state policy and by you know, current sort of state offerings, um, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. And then from there, you know, we started to do a little bit of an examination of some of the, um, some of the processes or products 
or um, convenings that the state offers around economic development. And I think what's been interesting there is sort of like how those how those entities connect and how they don't connect. And I think that was um, a part of what Dr. Charleston was um, was kind of alluding to is we've sort of, um, I think there was an assumption when we started our work that there were purposeful decisions made to keep certain pieces of um, the economic development picture like separate. Um, and so for example, um, in in Dr. Charleston's report on our subgroup work, we've learned so much from um, Tondra Davis from the um, Diversity Supplier Program over at DOA, and they put together this amazing report every year um, where you know it really provides a lot of information about um, state agencies' relationship to diverse contracting. Um, what we noticed and what our, the folks on our subgroup were telling us is like, that information is not shared in places where communities are naturally coming together. And, um, and so like, we're like, okay, there's a disconnect there. Um, and so I think what we're trying to do right now is grapple with a little bit of the diaspora that we feel, and again, Dr. Dr. Charleston referenced this, this sort of like, there are a lot of different entities doing economic development at the local level. And, um, some of them convene together, some of them don't convene together. We want to be really cognizant and really um, inclusive of all of the different entities doing um, economic development work. And then we want to connect. We don't want to duplicate. We don't want to um, you know, reinvent wheels. We want to really like coalesce and find those places where, um, where we can like better share this information. Um, and so I think we've got a really great subgroup because we, we see the puzzle, we see the problem from different vantage points. We've got a number of really engaged state agency folks. We've got a number of really engaged um, folks from the community who are really tapped into naturally occurring economic development circles. Um, and so now it's just about like sort of like magnetizing, I think our strategy to get us closer to, um, to, to actually making an impact. Um, and it looks like I can cast it over to Ruben. We've given him enough time. He's got, he's got it now. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. Ruben, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I understand the question correctly, what recommendations uh, do we have to align the subcommittee work with activities already taking place uh, within the yes. community? Yes. and then how we can use our voice to inform and support work already in progress in state mm -hmm. government. So um, one of the things that we've done in the last two weeks is we have a preliminary, the Wisconsin Black Chamber, we have a preliminary agreement with Marketplace. Um, uh, Marketplace is gonna take place on the 6th. Um, we're going to host a, um, a, minor, a black and diverse uh, business uh, procurement Expo the next day after Marketplace in the same space. And so um, what, and then we have preliminarily agreed to cross market as well. So the, 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 the promotions for Marketplace and the promotions for our uh, diverse um, procurement Expo are going to be cross marketed. Uh, and so I think that things like that are, are, are where we have opportunity to win because you know marketplace has always been one of those things for me that i kept saying marketplaces marketplace because this is the governor's conference on minority business mm -hmm. but uh, we also understand that those people that will be at marketplace are uh, established businesses that have been do doing business with the government for a while and they're normally the ones highlighted at marketplace uh, well the next day for us are businesses that um, would like to be showcased at Marketplace, but they're not ready yet. And so these will be all the businesses that we're getting ready for next year's Marketplace. And that's what we're telling people. That's how we're promoting it. Uh, we're planning to invite everyone who benefited from the bounce back grant, every business, uh, minority business, a diverse business that benefited from uh, the bounce back grant, we're inviting them to our particular event. And so it 
turns into a win-win, you know, for Marketplace and for what we're trying to do in uh, bringing uh, proof, proof of our work, right? Because this event is for us to prove our work for the resources that the governor has put into our community. How do we prove the work? We get that community that was just funded to show up. And so uh, we also got Milwaukee County. Uh, Milwaukee County wants to, basically they wanna host the conversation around procurement and getting more local businesses involved in procurement. Uh, and so, and we're still in conversations with the city um, as to what role they are, w are willing to play on that second day. And so, um, I, so I think things like this are the kind of things that, um, uh, where we have opportunity to prove um, or, or get a better feel of where all of these businesses are, the established businesses as well as uh, the new businesses we're bringing online, the businesses that, you know, got the technical assistance and the businesses that are, are working for the capacity building. And uh, because it's, it's Black, we, we're calling it <laughs> the Black and Diverse, right, uh, business uh, procurement expo, we have the opportunity to go out, us the chamber, we have the opportunity to go to the other ethnic and diverse uh, chambers and say, join us, right, at this event and let's show the direction, let's show what we've been talking about, all these, you know, we asked for this money, the governor gave it to us, now let's prove our work. And so um, that's that's kind of where I am in this conversation. That's great. That sounds like a very clear example of what um, Secretary Edmondson was talking about, using your experience with the marketplace to bridge and to identify areas where you can make those connections that need to be made with what you see as progress that needs to be made or ideas or actions that need to be taken with those activities that are already within the community and then bridge the community pieces that are not involved into that to get more information. So that's a perfect example of that. Is there is there a way for, um, with, with thinking about that, with thinking about that experience, you know, the experience of what you have um, uh, had as a member of the council, spe specific to your relative subcommittees, um, stepping away from economic, we given them. We put them on the spotlight. I'm going to go towards uh, data and community engagement. So, with your own experience, how have you applied that to understanding, you know, or understanding where there are areas where there needs to be more communication, or or have you identified um, activities or or things that are going on or initiatives that are going on related to either data or policy or community engagement? that as your lived experience, you want to bridge that communication and to develop that relationship and that you reached out? That's a question for me? Oh, it, it was a question for any of the subcommittees um, or members of the different various subcommittees to, to respond to, or anybody that would like to speak. Um, so, Marie, oh, okay. Go ahead, Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Go ahead, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, so I will share an example of, um, or re-highlight an example of us reaching beyond looking at state government, even though we've identified that as um, our goal, that state government should be the leader in these areas uh, involving employment to really um, leverage the experience and the expertise of um, within our subcommittee. So um, I've reported out that we've had a number of presentations from uh, state agencies. And in the process, that has caused us to think about um, in our own spheres of influence, where we may need to bring in an additional presentation or hear from other individuals. And that's what has led us to um, the presentation that we're going to have in September, which is a Milwaukee-based nonprofit who is actually working on barriers to long-term employment. And our charge talks about how are we going to eliminate barriers 
to employment and then have the voice of a, non of a nonprofit organization that is working with folks on the ground. And I think within that, we'll begin to see some of those um, synergy, some of those, um, I love that emergent practices that we can then um, share, right, out from our subcommittee and then throughout this council and in terms of crafting recommendations. So that's one piece I will add. The second is um, early on, we talked about surveying council members and it is within our guiding statement that we want to um, co-create recommendations by leveraging the experience of our fellow council members who have information, data, suggestions, recommendations, um, even though they don't, that are gonna be valuable to us, even though they don't sit on our subcommittee. And so I'm anticipating that as our subcommittee members work on the survey, it's going to be, uh, the questions are gonna be targeted towards what we've already seen and heard in our subcommittee and then saying, based on what we've heard, can you share your own um, experiences, recommendation of who, recommendations of who else we need to bring to the table? That's great. That's great. Anyone else? So when you when you decided to do that and, and, and take that path to gaining that information, um, Robin, where did you start? How did how did your subcommittee decide um, that these were the things or, that you needed to do in order to get that additional information? Um, can you just kind of tell us about your process? Well, you know, we have the benefit and I'm inviting the rest of the subcommittee who is on the call today to chime in, to jump in. But I mean, we first really leaned heavily on the experience of the secretaries who serve on our um, subcommittee in terms of what is, what's already happening within their agencies. And I think there was a statement earlier about the executive order and what is happening across state government. And then we you know, kind of moved down to, so what's happening in your agencies specifically? And because that was the low hanging fruit, it was obviously easier for us to you know, schedule those presentations to bring that information in. And then we actually went back to DHS for another presentation, because then we heard a little bit more about, as I talked earlier, about the Office of Health Equity. Um, the other part that was interesting is we heard early on from Dr. Carlton Jenkins about the use of um, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, as an opportunity or an avenue for building out um, a recruitment pipeline. And then last month, we heard how the Office of Health Equity used that as a new strategy. So I think that, you know, coming out of this, and I've also heard in my own community businesses that have made a very intentional effort to um, employ and leverage H HBCUs. So some of it, I just think has been a natural evolution of our discussions. As we keep hearing more information, we keep thinking about, that question keeps coming up. What are we gonna talk about next? Who do we wanna to bring to the table based on what we heard um, today? Or, and when I say today, I mean, based on what we've heard in that um, subcommittee meeting, okay, now what's the next step? Who should we invite to the table next? And those, those suggestions have naturally bubbled up. That's awesome. Um, Secretary Timberlake, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Larise, and thanks, Robin. I think Robin did a, her usual great job of giving that overview of our process. I think the only other thing I would maybe just uh, share with the whole council, because those of us on the subcommittee have been, you know, deep into it, is as Robin noted, we opted to focus on employment first. We then did some work to kind of map out the life cycle of a successful hire all the way through to mentoring and retention and organizational culture. And then we sort of backed ourselves up to say, well, it all starts with recruitment, really all starts with designing the position description, but you know, recruitment is then kind of the natural next step. And so I think to Robin's point, you know, kind of having that focus and then seeing just tapping the naturally occurring 
connections that we all had was uh, is sort of where we are right now. Um, and while I'm off mute, I'll just say um, I know that I am really excited about the work that DOA and Jen and the team are leading around workforce modernization. And I remain very optimistic that a lot of the insights and a lot of the recommendations that are going to come out of our subcommittee, both learnings that are being drawn from good practice across the state enterprise and good practice from our partners in the wider state, as Robin alluded to, very optimistic that that can be fed in fairly directly to some of the workforce modernization conversation. So that's kind of an answer to question two as well. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any- um, yeah, That was, um, I liked it. I, again, I'm on the uh, Economic Development Committee. And so, um, you know, when I think about workforce, I always think about businesses that can hire that workforce. And so um, I, the last two days I was in Peoria at the National Black Chambers Convention. And one of the things, well, the, the three main points that came out of the discussion that we were having with the uh, related to um, uh, procurement, which meant more work for businesses of color, was that there was issues with paperwork so, the, you know, the whole concept that the money is in the paperwork. So there were a lot of businesses that were applying uh, for contracts, but the paperwork was, they didn't understand the paperwork, right? So they could never understand why they weren't winning, winning bids and stuff like that. Um, the second thing was unbundling. Uh, they, the, the, the state started going in unbundling contracts um, uh, because the way the contracts were bundled, they had to give everything to, you know, one person. And then the third thing, they began to ask, ask the, the uh, architects and the people that were designing projects to design for uh, inclusion and diversity and inclusion. So that as they're designing the project, they can also uh, separate uh, all, all of the different requirements for whatever it is that they're doing by where, you know, somebody can do this, 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 and this, instead of just giving it to them as one thing. And so those were really three uh, major uh, points that they uh, were making for the improvements that they've made in, in the state of Illinois with their uh, participation goals. And so, um, uh, and so for me, that's where the, the, that's where all of this leads. You know, we, we have to do a better job in preparing our businesses to certify and uh, as well as apply for funding. And, but on the other side, the, if everything is bundled or uh, if, if there's, you know, no room for uh, smaller firms to apply, then that again, kind of defeats the purpose as well. So that's kind of where, um, it's just kind of where my thinking is in, in this conversation. Thank you. Um, you made a comment that a lot of the themes that um, were mentioned are coming up in, our, in your employment as well. Did you want to elaborate a little bit on that or? Sure, just to say that Ruben, I appreciate that overview of some of the barriers and some of the things that need to change in the contracting process. And if you, as I was listening to you, if, if I take that up one level, you can hear a lot of very common elements in the way we need to be thinking about employment as well. In other words, if we think about a job as a contract opportunity, a lot of the same barriers that you're speaking to, we are also identifying in our subcommittees work and, and having some similar conversations about the ways that the struck the way we structure the creation of jobs, the way we structure how we recruit, the qualifications and the expertise we expect people to have, all of those things are also barriers to a more inclusive state workforce. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me just keep checking the chat. Were there any, were there any 
other comments or any other group that wanted to respond to the questions or just to acknowledge um, how they have started their thought process around um, aligning their work with what's going on within the community? Larissa, if I may, I know that the, um, so I've hopped on a couple of calls with the community engagement. I know they they have a large territory. And as we talked about, like just the state agencies, I'm wondering um, if we could ask the, the community engagement committee, if you want to share what you guys have came up with. I know you have a larger territory you're covering and statewide. Yeah, my um, thank you for that. I, I know that within our subcommittee, there was difficulties in kind of identifying where to start because there was a lot of infrastructure that had already done kind of community celebrations and education. So what an area that we were looking at was kind of where was there intentional or visible growth that might have the growing pains of visible diversity or might have the need of ed education or might have more stewardship needing um, within that promotion of celebratory or education within diversity. Um, so I know that that was something that we looked at regionally to see what were the regions um, or the regions that had that significant growth um, within diversity within its residents and school districts. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to comment? Yep, yep. this is Shondell. Um, yeah. I'm also on the community engagement uh, committee. And in addition to what was just stated, um, some of the conversations around like honoring that there are organizations and agencies that are doing this community work and how can we in those areas, um, how can we get those agencies and communities together to kind of talk through ways in which we can promote these events statewide, um, those that are appropriate to promote statewide. Um, and so that's also kind of where that whole conversation with the travel and tourism department comes into play. Um, we've talked about kind of doing some pilot programs in different areas as well. Um, and, and things like that to kind of engage and to honor the work that has already taken place as well. Thank you. I can imagine um, community engagement having to consider what are the regional um, activities that are taking place across the state and that they're varying based upon the populations in those areas and that there's a lot of mapping of a landscape that you would have to do. Um, targeting probably various regions one at a time or areas one at a time to think about how we can engage to support and advance um, information around the work that's being done by those communities to um, celebrate and acknowledge um, the, the diversity that exists within through celebration and um, communication of those activities. So mm -hmm. I, I know you have a big job ahead of you, community engagement group, because you have the entire state. So I appreciate you chiming in and um, providing that information. So thank you. Yeah, um, and Larissa, La and, and my, if I can just add, also the infrastructure within these community um, events is also very different. Um, infrastructures being all community volunteers and then different infrastructures where there's much more support within their chamber or an organized nonprofit, a 501 KNC. So even within the cultural events and celebrations, the infrastructure within that is, is very different. Yes, it is. Thank you, um, Secretary, for that. Um, smile face for everybody and their comments. And thank you, Mai, for pointing out um, that information around the infrastructure and the challenges and barriers that are there for you to overcome as you work to, to provide, um, um, to bring together that community engagement piece. Was there um, anyone else that wanted to comment or speak about um, how as a group we can continue to 
um, share and provide our voices um, to the work that's already being done in government? Are there any methods or ideas that you have or that you've been thinking about um, to help you to navigate or to identify um, where you need to start within the landscape? Have you regionalized it? Have you done it by population? Have you looked at it economically? Like, you know, where were those areas that needed the most? Um, even even when you're just thinking about the, the, the state, have you thought about it in that way? Well, I'm going to um, ask if there are any other comments before we move on in the meeting and I will turn everything back over to my. Um, any last comments you can put in the chat or you can let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larise. And if we don't, I don't see any comments um, or any additional questions or comments in the chat, feel free to drop it in the chat as we continue to move. But I want to thank you all for, oh, uh, Palau. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Yeah, no, and I just have a quick comment. Um, just as we are wrapping up, um, I am currently working. I was, before I was working for UW Madison, but since um, for the last six months, I have been working for the Department of Agriculture uh, trade and consumer protection. So now I am part of the state and it's a whole different experience when you are part of the organization and you can actually see how the, the, the operations and the connections happen. Uh, rather than giving in, a, 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 oh, thank you, thank you, appreciate it. So rather than giving an, an impression, uh, I'm going to um, state, um, an opportunity. And, and I have seen, um, so far I have seen connected efforts within a, a decentralized organization. I'll give you an example. Um, we attended, um, we as, org as, organi as organization, a state agency, we attended Juneteenth uh, celebrations in four, uh, locations throughout Wisconsin. It was really empowering to see other state agencies being represented as well there, connecting with our communities, um, sharing information, establishing connections. Uh, I think that this is where the opportunity lies. Uh, I think that we have the opportunity to identify and leverage the work of those champions that are already doing the work um, and the possibility that this council has to, uh, to amplify. Those work, you know, the works of, of those organizations to promote, to showcase, to emulate for others to say, yeah, how can we begin to have more of a presence? How can we apply these lessons into our work that there is, you know, there is the opportunity for each of our agencies to establish those kind of collaborations. So I think that that's, uh, that's just my note of, I think, identification and leverage, leveraging the work of those champions that are doing some, you know, some work in, in interconnecting, in providing services for the communities and, and promoting that for others to know, because uh, I think, Dr. Charleston was talking about, you know, the uh, the question of, and I made a note of what what is there that I need to know that I don't know. So how can we interconnect with that unknown um, stakeholder in the underserved communities? So that was just my note, and I'll conclude with that. Thank you so much, Palau. Appreciate that. And, you know, 
through the conversations I've heard a couple of things over and over again that I think we're all in alignment with is creating synergy. As we're creating synergy um, and to answer the question of how can we use our voices to inform and support work already in, in process in state government is knowing, um, again, going back to, I, I implore you all to connecting with those different partners as an advisory council is so crucial. I think one of our goals, two goals that we uh, initially want to, to chime in is, is building collective action, right? And so uh, Don, you have your hand up and I know you, this is gonna be a great comment coming from you, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to um, commend you on the power mapping layout because what we saw in that layout really was the synergy of the work that's happening. When I think about all of our initial appointments to the council, it was about the expertise that people bring. So it was wonderful to hear Lavar, uh, Dr. Charleston and Robin Davis, as well as Emily, uh, Secretary Amundsen, talk about first starting within the group and hearing the expertise and the experiences that the group is bringing to the council and to the work of the subcommittee. And so starting there as the foundation approach and then utilizing the contacts and connections that members have to better build their own capacity and inform the work has been wonderful to see. And then ultimately to hear Reuben Hopkins talk about how to extend the work of the Black marketplace, how to shine a bright light on those successes, but yet bringing in those new recipients of the grants that have been at it for a long time, but have not been able to properly access the money, utilizing their resources on their own and being able to extend their expertise in the work to better provide services and goods for the state. So it's wonderful to see the engagement, the connection and the movement from um, the work that has been done over the last year and a half, how it's really starting to become tangible. We're seeing people benefit like uh, the $3.4 billion that Jessica Cazavas received as part of the uh, Latino Chamber, and the ability that uh, the governor's office and DOA has had to identify uh, those businesses who could benefit from additional influx of resources and to have done that. So I'm really pleased to hear the discussion, to participate in the discussion, and to see our work continue to flourish. So my thank you so much for walking us through that mapping and really synthesizing what's happening. Thank you so much, Don. We appreciate it and can't thank you enough for your leadership up to this point to bringing us to uh, the fruition of this council and, and, I, and I really look forward to the leadership of this council moving forward into the next year. So again, thank you all so much for contributing uh, your hard work, your additional meeting hours that you put in and, and so in the conversation. So uh, if we shall move, if there's no additional comments or remarks, I guess we, we could move to the uh, next topic on our, our, our agenda is council operations. And so looking at the council operations here, uh, we have one more meeting scheduled for this year. At the meeting, subcommittees at this next meeting, subcommittees will uh, provide recommendation, recommended actions for the strategies in their work plans. Subcommittee chairs will receive guidance, uh, guidance documents in the emails, in your emails this month. Um, so watch out for those. And the term uh, appointment for all council members will end in January of next year. So we are already, can you believe we're saying this, is our term um, is coming up in January and we're, we've done um, so much work already, like Adon had mentioned. So during the November meeting, council members will receive information on reappointments um, 
Governor Evers had also mentioned that earlier, that uh, Kara and the governor's office will be reaching out to each of you also. So more to come um, in, in terms of the reappointments. And the role of the vice chair, we did send that out a few uh, meetings ago. We talked about finding a new vice chair. However, given the time and the position of chair is essential to this council, um, we want to review again the uh, what the chair, the vice chair will be looking at doing or their responsibilities is the vice chair, again, provides the chair council and guidance as needed, um, provides leadership and guidance to subcommittee chairs, proactively drive the administrative task and, need, and needs of the council. Um, the vice chair also assists the chair with communications as needed, uh, ensures the proper introduction and development of subcommittee chairs, and because of the importance uh, of this role, we have decided to wait to February 2023 meeting to accept nominations for the position. So definitely please consider that as we're looking. This also allows the vice chair to start on a brand new term for the next two years in the appointment. So, um, and so the process of uh, selecting a new vice chair, just wanna share that out again, as a reminder, each council member will receive information in an email following the February, 2023 meeting on the roles and responsibilities of the position. This information will include a survey um, for members interested in the vice chair position to complete. Uh, we encourage you to do that so. And then once the information is received, interested members will be contacted to discuss the position. Um, the final appointment will be um, a decision made by and during the May 2023 uh, meeting. And I, I cannot believe we're already talking about 2023 So, uh, in our meetings right now. So with that, I do want to conclude on that part. And then we want to go ahead and look at future meetings. Um, any questions about the vice chair I, appointment? We would definitely encourage you all to think about that. All right. And so if no questions or comments, um, we will move forward. So future meeting dates, um, we have each, uh, so I do want to first, before we go to the future meeting dates, want to take a moment uh, to thank each and every one of you. Um, I cannot believe we, we again have come this far, all of your hard work, the council would not have come this far without your committed time and efforts in each of your subcommittees and attending these meetings here. And so thank you all so much for sharing, showing up, engage each time to share your knowledge and time um, with the council today. So future meeting dates, we do have a full council quarterly meeting. Our next meeting is Friday, uh, November 11th from 9 to 12 p.m. Again, this is the last meeting of the year. Um, subcommittee dates um, are listed as below. Uh, data and policy, you're meeting again September 15th and October 20th economic development and business development, uh, your next meeting is today, August 19th. Uh, and then community engagement is September 20th. Uh, just a reminder, please send um, additional meeting dates over to uh, Larice as soon as you can, if you have those identified, that way uh, they could put that out also for your in, in time for your next meeting. All right, so given that, um, is there any additional questions or comments? If not, I will now accept a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second, Marie Summers. Thank you so much. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned. Right. Thank you all again Thank so you. much for joining us in this meeting today. Take care. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good Have weekend. Have a everyone. wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Mai. Thank you so much, John. Congratulations, Mai. <laughs>